Hello, Mum. <laughs> right. Uh, oh, hello, Brighton. Right, thanks, Danny, for those kind words. That was really good. Um, wow, there's already been some really inspiring talks here this morning. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm hoping I'm going to be inspiring too. Uh, but what I'd really like to do is bring to life the practical uh, sort of practice of innovation. And I want to do that um, from a perspective of both working client side, uh, as I do now at The Guardian, and also from my experience of working agency side. So just out of interest, I might need the lights up a little bit. I'd just love it if I could see people putting their hands up if they currently work client side for an organisation. OK, cool. And then how about agency side? All right, so it's a pretty even spread. That's really good. That's really interesting. Well, hopefully, by the end of this talk, um, you guys are going to understand each other a little bit better. And also, what I really want to do is leave you today with some principles um, that are going to give you confidence in your sort of practical approach to innovation. And as Danny mentioned, I'm going to get to those principles by trying to answer these three questions. And those questions are, why innovate, how to innovate, and how not to innovate. Now, in preparation for this, Danny was, let's say, pretty clear that he didn't want me to tell my life story as an intro. But it is important to talk a little bit about The Guardian and what it means to me to work for such a strong brand. And I also want to talk a little bit now, because it's important later, about the unique ownership structure of The Guardian. We're owned by the Scott Trust, which keeps us financially independent. And what that means is, if you support The Guardian, and we make a profit, that profit does not go into the hands of a stakeholder, a sort of Logan Roy character. What happens is that profit goes straight back into the independent journalism and the experiences that me and my team and the engineers create. In coming to The Guardian, I've come to a place that already prizes innovation. We're in a 24-7 news cycle and a period in human history where technology is advancing at an exponential rate. And our digital experiences at the moment reach around 128 million unique visitors every month. Now, previously, I worked for another media organisation which had, let's say, a slightly different political leaning. And leaving there and joining The Guardian feels a little bit like escaping the Death Star and joining the Rebellion. And for those of you that aren't Star Wars fans, let's just say I came out of the dark and into the light. As director of product design, I lead a really diverse team at The Guardian, and I love that because I think that that diversity creates that push and pull of creative thinking that's really important. We've got different disciplines within the team. So we've got UI design, as you would expect, and UX design. We've started to introduce service design, which is quite new to The Guardian, and I think that's going to be really important moving forward. And we've invested significantly in UX research. When I joined The Guardian just over two years ago, or around two years ago, unfortunately, the UX research team weren't in a perfect place. And within a couple of weeks of me joining, pretty much all but one of the team quit, which wasn't great, but hopefully wasn't too much to do with me. It was pretty stressful. But I now look back, and I think that was really a blessing in disguise, because We've recruited a new research team that's led by Anna Leggett, who's in the middle of this picture. Um, Georgia's actually here at the conference, so if you want to talk to anyone about UX research, she's, she's here to talk to you. But the great thing about this team is they've moved away from what, what the team were doing when I joined The Guardian, which was lots of validatory research, lots of user testing of prototypes, and they've moved to, towards... Um, they've moved towards more ethnographic research. So we're doing lots more kind of diary studies and that type of, type of research. We really want to understand what people's lives are like, and we want to um, design products and features and solutions that really talk to their needs. So now that I've briefly introduced The Guardian and my team, let's get to that first question, why innovate? 
In four years working at an innovation agency, the projects that I worked on were wide and varied. To name a few, I worked with aeronautical engineers who were using 3D scanning technology to try and repair Hercules bombers. I also worked for a department within the Foreign Commonwealth Office on a project that I can't even talk about. And then I did this project with a craft beer company where we rebranded one of their beers. And this is a picture of one of my colleagues running a focus group, which literally involved us organizing a piss up in a brewery. <laughs> so there are lots of reasons why organizations want to be more innovative. Perhaps they want to add new products to their portfolio, or maybe they want to be more efficient. Perhaps they want to be more sustainable or meet changing regulations. Maybe they just want to make the world a better place. At The Guardian, for us, it's about product diversification. As I explained earlier, our journalism is reaching more and more people every day, 128 million visitors a month. And we also have the unique commercial model that I explained earlier. We're open to all, funded by many, and beholden to none. What this means is our journalism will always be free, and that's because over a million people support us on a monthly basis. But there is a limit, right, to the amount of people that are going to support The Guardian this way regularly on a monthly basis. And what we do know is that that financial support follows the peaks and troughs of the news cycle. To bring this to life, I'd like to share this visual, which I personally like to refer to as Trump's bump. And what it tells us is around the time that Donald Trump got elected, we see it saw this massive, massive peak in engagement with the news. And here you can see 48 million page views on one day. So it's, you know, it's pretty understandable that people, we're going to see this traffic when people are highly engaged with the news. But the other thing to consider is organisations like The Guardian will see a similar peak in the way that people support us financially at times like this. So what we want is to be less dependent on these peaks and troughs of the news cycle. So it makes good sense to us to look and develop new products and services. And the way that we approach that, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with IDEO's approach, where they kind of state that for a product proposition to be successful, it needs to be desirable, viable, and feasible. And if it meets that trifecta, then you feel like you're going to have really good success. And what we do is we add to that a fourth element, which is our editorial strength. So anything that we develop has to be aligned to our editorial strengths, even editorially led. But within these guardrails, there's lots of exciting areas for us to explore. How might we help people in America engage with our football content? How might we help people travel more sustainably? Or how might we help people make better choices when it comes to food? So maybe innovation is actually about people. The people that have a need we're trying to meet, the people that we're going to partner with, and the people within our team. Which leads me nicely to our next question, how to innovate. If we're creating new innovative products, we're going to need a team of people. Now, when I worked agency side, I'd often find myself with a client team. And on the surface, you'd think they're really diverse, right? But quickly, I'd realized that they'd been hired for cultural culture fit. And whilst they might have some serious intellectual horsepower, when it came to creative problem solving, they could be fatally limited. And they would always revert to their kind of normal, logical ways of solving problems instead of going out and looking for customer insight and trying to come up with more radical ideas. Unlike skin color, gender, or age diversity, cognitive diversity is invisible. One of the massive advantages that I think agencies have is this ability to attract really, really diverse people. The last agency that I worked at was so proud of our eclectic mix of backgrounds that we actually referred to ourselves as lovable misfits. 
But the good news, if you're working client side, is that there's probably so much more diversity in your team than you think. And diversity doesn't mean being more creative, it means being more everything. So more detailed, more persistent, more cautious. So the first principle that I want to give you is work with people who think differently. And once we've got the right people, we're going to need a little bit of a process. When I was working agency side, I'd often be asked to capture a framework, like a kind of visual representation of our framework. Um, and if you're working for an agency, you've got a real kind of vested interest in doing this, right? Because that's what you're selling. So it's really helpful to be able to articulate that to your clients. When it comes to frameworks, I've always really loved the simplicity of this uh, visual, which hopefully some of you have already seen. I think it's called a design squiggle, which seems like a kind of appropriate name for it. And when you're innovating new products and services or features, it really, the journey can really feel a lot like this. You've got this messy bit at the beginning. And you're going to need some people in your team that are really kind of confident and courageous in that messy bit, really comfortable with it. Because in that messy bit, that's where you can be more perceptive, more responsive, and more improvisational. But there has to be a balance. Where I'm working at The Guardian, in many places, there's going to be people, probably your stakeholders, that think in a much more structural way. For example, a chief financial officer. So we're going to need some kind of logical steps to, to kind of help them through the process. And I think something, you know, the kind of confidence of a tried and tested framework, like the double diamond, which again, hopefully some of you are familiar with, really helps people understand where we've come from, where we're at at that point in time, and where we're going next. So the second principle is, Embrace confusion and clarity. So we're all practicing human-centered design, which we all are, right? So if we're practicing this human-centered design, we want to start from a place of solving genuine user problems. The third principle I want to talk to you about is getting close to your customers and solving real problems. Now, this is going to be a really interesting moment in this talk for me to navigate because it's highly unusual for The Guardian to talk about products before they've launched. But it's also really useful to have a case study. So I'm definitely not saying publicly that we're <laughs> definitely not saying publicly that we're um, working on a product related to food. But if we were, we'd probably have some assumptions about what people might want from a food product. So we'd want to talk to some real people to see what they want from a food product. So if we did do that, let's have a listen and see what they might say. I think it's just easier so I can, you know, to scroll through things and not being tempted by whatever is at the end of the aisle. So yeah, whenever is online, try to make smarter choices, and usually it's better for my budget as well because I don't buy random stuff and I really know what I want. To be honest, I do want to eat healthy, and when the responsible me goes shopping, I do buy all the veggies and low-calorie snacks and whatnot, but then I find myself miserable, and then I end up ordering delivery anyway, and then I'm left with all this root veg, carrots, potato, and lettuce in the produce drawer, wilting and sad. I live in London, so it's really easy for me to be a vegetarian here. There's so many options of uh, restaurants and produce at supermarkets and just alternatives to buy. But when I go to see my parents and we go out to a restaurant, uh, there really isn't much for me there. Um, maybe just some chips and a side salad, uh, a harissa hummus at best. So I purchased a vegetable cutter on Amazon to help me prep my meals quicker. And I bought an air fryer as well too, actually, which makes you know, meal prep that much easier. And my flatmates use it too, which is great. So a little spoiler alert, if you do find yourself doing research on food, you're going to learn a lot about air fryers right now. Um, 
OK, and now you've also met some of the team from The Guardian, right? Because I definitely would not be stupid enough to put real research participants on screen, uh, especially when one of the research team are here. The point I'm trying to make is that our assumptions about what people want can often be wrong, and it's the research that gives us the confidence to pursue our ideas. And that leads me to my next point, which is about generating ideas. Now, the evidence tells us that the road to the perfect product is paved with imperfection. And for every one great idea, there will be many, many bad ideas. So our job is to think differently, listen to that research, and then come up with lots of ideas. Now, if we go back to this hypothetical food product, if we wanted to quickly develop some ideas, what we could do is use the sort of middle bit of that double diamond and run a 48-hour idea acceleration event. And if we did do that, we might have even called it our fast food event. The good news is, within organisations like The Guardian and others, there are loads of people that would love two days away from a spreadsheet, away from a senior leadership meeting, and to come along and come up with ideas around a new product or feature. And inviting teams from across an organisation to help us in this way means that we're going to get a real kind of diverse approach to the thinking, and we're going to get a diverse set of ideas. And that's what we're looking for in the process of innovation. So if we had done this, we might have come up with some ideas a bit like this. A fruit and veg machine. Take a picture of the fruit and veg in your fridge, and it will give you a recipe. Or maybe Duolingo for cooking, a fun and structured way to develop your cooking skills. Or what about tofu eating wokarati dinner party? Every Guardian recipe but the meat's replaced with tofu. These sound like really playful ideas, but they are grounded in research and they do bring to life some quite interesting concepts. For example, reducing food waste, developing skills, or adapting content for personal preference. In just a couple of days, you're not going to, you, you know, you're highly unlikely to find the killer idea that's going to secure the future of your business. But you can share your ambition for your initiative, and you can bring everyone on the in the organisation along on your innovation journey. And what you will definitely do is come up with lots of ideas. So my fourth principle is when it comes to ideas, more is more. And when you've got these ideas, you're going to want to test them just as quickly. So I want to go back to my sort of agency days now. Um, one of the benefits that agencies have, right, is not having too much skin in the game. If you're only going to be engaged with a client for, say, six weeks or a five-day design sprint or maybe even six months, this can lead to an awful lot of boldness. You can go in and you can ask difficult questions. You can challenge opinions. You can get in front of customers and you can experiment really quickly. So I'm now going to share a fray into AI that I made several years ago. And I'm pretty sure it's not going to be the first or last AI chatbot anecdote that's mentioned today. But it is quite unique. We were working for a bank in Dubai. Now, Dubai is about the size of Birmingham, I think it was when we did this. And there are around 40 banks in that area, all competing for customers' attention. And the bank that we were working with felt that AI could be a real differentiator for them. So they wanted to invest in it. And several years ago, investment in AI would have been massive. So what we said was, let's talk to some customers and see if they're going to actually engage with this. And through conversations with customers, we realised that they were kind of interested in communicating with the bank in this way, but only if the way that they communicated provided really meaningful information to their sort of in individual financial situation. So we created a ProBite chatbot. Now, don't judge me, because this is several years ago. I've said that, and it's a very lightweight UI. But while customers thought they were talking to an AI chatbot, they were actually talking to my colleague, Nick. 
If I go back to the agency that I mentioned earlier, where we called ourselves Lovable Misfits, that's where I work with Nick. And Nick didn't study innovation. He actually studied law. And then he worked at the financial ombudsman before coming to work for our agency, um, which made him the perfect candidate to play a, a kind of financial chatbot. Um, so, look, in a few weeks, we were really able to validate how customers would actually use this service. And then we could understand if it's actually worth that significant investment at that time. And all we needed to do that was a really lightweight UI and Nick and his laptop. So my fifth principle is use experiments to learn quickly. So hopefully I've given you some good examples of how to innovate, but we've got this last question, right? How not to innovate? Hands down, for me, in my experience, the most common challenge that I've had on these types of projects or initiatives is when you get a brief that starts with a solution looking for a problem. Clients start from a place where they want to think differently, but quickly they become really risk averse. They stop investing in research, and then they just develop an existing idea that's been sitting on the shelf. Or even worse, they'll copy a competitor The first project that I worked on at this innovation agency was for a computer game retailer. They just had their annual report done and it reported this significant loss. So they were looking to reduce costs, um, try and work more efficiently, obviously increase sales. So they'd come to this assumption that they wanted this content managed platform. And if they invested in this, this was going to help them. But we wanted to challenge that. They had lots of quantitative data around basket value, but they lacked those nuanced insights that you get for qualitative research that I mentioned earlier. So we spent around six weeks getting close to their customers. We went into stores, we went into their homes, we spoke about their Minecraft creations. We even went to gaming shows. This woman that I'm speaking to here, um, she was at a gaming show at the NEC in Birmingham for two days. She had two children competing in tournaments and she was camping in the NEC. Um, so there's parenting goals for you, anyone out there that's got kids. Um, what we convinced this company to do was to invest in their people and run experiments like the one I've just shared with you. Um, and yeah, we, we really wanted to, we knew there was a lot of talent in the organisation because people had worked as like store managers and worked their way up through the organisation. So this is a sort of one of the sort of experiments that we ran where we asked store managers to put together personalised reviews. And when we measured the performance of this content, we found it really resonated and it actually outperformed the corporate marketing content by around 70%. So in the end, it really wasn't just about the tech and a content management system was not going to solve their problems. So my advice to you here is if you are faced with a brief that feels a bit like a solution looking for a problem, please don't be afraid to challenge why, because that's our job. And the sixth principle is to look for solutions to problems, not the other way around. So I'm going to wrap up a little bit now, because um, I'm conscious that I'm just in between you and your lunch. I've spoken about a handful of principles. Work with people who think differently. Embrace clarity and confusion. Get close to your customers. When it comes to ideas, more is more. Use experiments to learn quickly. Look for solutions to problems, not the other way around. But there's this last point that I want to make. Let me explain. I've shared quite a lot of positive experiences working for agencies. And I've also said that agencies can benefit from not having skin in the game. But paradoxically, I think this can be a drawback. I worked for an innovation agency for four years. And it's really difficult for me to point to the products that I worked on that are in the hands of real people. There's a really great video on YouTube that features Steve Jobs, and he's talking to a group of consultants. You might have seen it. 
And the point that he's making is that without owning something over an extended period of time, you miss out on the opportunity to take responsibility for your recommendations. And you miss out on the opportunity to see those recommendations through every stage of delivery. When you work inside an organisation, you accumulate scar tissue from the mistakes that you make. You have to pick yourself up and dust yourself down. But I believe it does make you better as a practitioner. And I think it will make the, better pro the, the future products that you make better too. So the last thing that I want to leave you with is take responsibility for your recommendations. It, it really does not matter whether you work agency side or client side. What matters is that you care about these people I mentioned at the beginning. There's the people that have a need that we're trying to meet. There's the people that we need to partner with. There's the people in our team. We need to care deeply that there is a history to the problem that we're solving and that there's a future to it. And that some of the people we're working with now are going to have to carry that forward. So please give them the tools to help them continue with that. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>